Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, the legislative elections in Virginia were one of the most consequential in recent history. We're joining me to discuss the results and implications of the 2023 election is Dr. Edward Lynch, professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at Hollins University, and Dr. Karen Holt, professor of political science and director of the PhD program for the Center for Public Administration and Policy at Virginia Tech. I should also note that Dr. Lynch is a political analyst for WSLS Television in Roanoke, and Dr. Holt is the political analyst for WFXR, also in Roanoke, and I have the privilege to serve as analyst for WDBJ7. And so, colleagues, thank you so much. Of course. At thank least you for inviting us. Yes, exactly. it, it, it's not election night, but we at least get to be together. And talk to each other. And yes, exactly, to exactly. <laughs> well, before we break it down, um, I'd just be curious about what one of your top two or three or whatever, what are your takeaways now with a couple of days hints? Ed, I'll start with you. Well, I think you could actually make an argument, uh, and I know not many people are doing this, you could actually make an argument that the Democrats underperformed, even though they had a wonderful night. I, I'm not taking anything away. They are, I'm sure, still celebrating that they're going to control both houses of the General Assembly come January. but. When the redistricting occurred, and this is the most thorough and the, really the most radical redistricting we have had in decades, the analysis when that was published at the time was that it probably gave the Democrats a net gain of six favorable seats in the House of Delegates. That is, when you weed out all of those that are safe and look at the competitive races, based on earlier voting and how they voted in the governor's race, the most recent presidential race, it's the, the analysis at the time seemed to conclude that there were maybe six seats that should be leaning Democratic net, um, which means if they end up with 51 or 52, that's probably fewer than they should have had. It's uh, just based on the redistricting, which means some of their candidates uh, lost unexpectedly. Uh, and that, uh, that's, once that sort of sinks in, that's not going to say a whole lot for, or that's not going to, to preview a whole lot, I don't think, much cooperation in the General Assembly. I mean, it would be one thing if Republicans could tell themselves, okay, we, we tried, we lost, this is the majority, we need to work with them. But if they conclude that, well, gee, they didn't really do as well as they should have, that's going to prompt the Republicans, I think, to dig in their heels more once the session starts in January. Interesting. And Karen? I agree. That I think the redistricting was a, was a very important part of this election for a variety of reasons, because the one, the one positive thing that we keep, or at least I think is positive, about the redistricting is that the, you cannot pay attention to incumbents. And so a lot of the high-quality candidates, one could argue, both parties, we're put in the same district with another incumbent. And so that makes all kinds of things different, adapting to new district constituencies and things like that. I do think that makes a difference. I tend to agree on this notion of underperforming on the Democratic side, although I think one could also argue that the Democrats at some level did not have a very good hand being dealt to them. We know that the economy was an issue for many voters in Virginia. Mm -hmm. We also know that President Biden's public approval levels are far below Governor Yunkin's levels. Those things tend to mean there'll be a depressed turnout for Democrats in this election. So I think some of that is going on too. Having said that, I do think abortion was not as important as an issue as it keeps being maintained over and over again, but it was an issue with this election underscored here, as well as in the Democratic wavelet that happened Tuesday night in other states like Ohio and, and um, Kentucky, certainly, and New Jersey. That's saying that that's going to be a continuing issue, not only in the Commonwealth, but also throughout the fall campaigns. I think that's important. Final thing I want to mention that we probably will talk about is the impact of school district politics. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think Governor Youngkin, of course, introduced that when he was elected governor, and that really has found legs in Virginia. On the other hand, one could argue that the school district politics has turned negative and nasty in some parts of the, of the Commonwealth, and some people arguably reacted to that and turned out to vote for a different set of school board members. We saw that happen in Northern Virginia, a little bit less so in this part of the state. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I agree. Um, I think that races in many ways have become nationalized. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so much outside money, influence coming in. I do think abortion was there, and we'll talk about Youngkin sure. if his inoc inoculation uh, attempt uh, worked or not. Um, but I think it's certainly, I mean, over 50% of the Democratic ads 
mentioned uh, mm -hmm. um, abortion. Mm -hmm. They had 40% of them in terms of their rotation, mm -hmm. high rotation there. Yeah, if I could just give a, yep. a personal illustration of that, uh, the week, weekend before the election, I happened to uh, be at a conference in Washington and I was staying in Northern Virginia and went, you know, went to a sports bar for dinner and they had all the TVs on and every ad that I saw for the General Assembly, every single one, A, was for a Democrat, so they were spending a lot more money in Northern Virginia, at least in the last weekend, and two, every last one of them mentioned abortion. Trying to boost the turnout in some mm -hmm. of those districts to be sure, even though at the same time, I certainly heard the same thing doing some DC area television. So going into the, to the news broadcast, you'd hear that over and over, ads going on. Most were about abortion, some were about crime right. in addition. Now that, that's mm -hmm. more for the, the Republicans, of course, mm -hmm. and some about school boards. And so I think that whole mix up there was somewhat different than we've seen in this part of the state of Virginia. Absolutely, absolutely. And it was critical in some of the most competitive yes, in Hampton yes. Roads, Virginia yes. Beach, and in, in Richmond. Um, the thing about abortion, though, that's the reason you need to vote. Republicans didn't have a messaging, the message. No. They had too many issues in a way, it mm -hmm. seemed like. Thought they were, you know, the, 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 the table kind of issues. And so I don't think Republicans were quite as good in terms of having, okay, give me a reason to vote Republican. Well, and, and in addition to that, I think, is that Governor Yunkin's effort to keep pushing the 15-week the ban, I think, was more difficult for some Republican voters. That is, I, on the Republican side, one could maybe argue that what Governor Yunkin was trying to do was walk a narrow path to attract some independents while keeping some of the Republican base. Mm -hmm. I think that was a very risky strategy, and we may find with some of the voters it failed. He was not mega enough or anti-abortion enough for some of those voters to turn out. And I would uh, agree with that. Uh, this is, uh, you know, midterm elections, yes. uh, particularly in the third year of an administration or base elections. Uh, I think that uh, Governor Yunkin really had to give his own base some some reason to pull out or to turn out for yes. the election. But, you know, since the Dobbs decision, and this is something that uh, as a political analyst puzzles me to the point of bothering me, <laughs> it's almost like fingernails on a blackboard. Republicans have been agitating and and doing activism and talking about the Roe v. Wade decision for almost 50 years. And when they got it reversed, which it was evidently what they wanted for all that time, they had absolutely no idea what to do next. I was they, they astounded the, by that. They caught the truck and the dog didn't know what to do. <laughs> but, but more than that, I think that the country has changed as well. Certainly younger voters, both parties are really more for at least abortion rights pro-choice, which is not necessarily the same as pro-life. So I think, right. I think that's, that creates some difficulties for Republicans trying to really crystallize that issue to get people to turn out. Well, I would agree with that. Uh, and it's particularly difficult when you cede the field completely yes, to, the, yes. to the other of course, party. Of course it is, I mean, yes. it, What Republicans need to do, in my opinion, is to ask some of their Democratic opponents, are there any restrictions at all on abortion that you would support? What about late term? What about uh, a child that survives an abortion? Uh, you know, Northam uh, got into uh, trouble, Ralph Northam got into trouble when he said, well, the infant is kept comfortable and then we have a conversation. Uh, what about uh, parental notification? What about some of these other things? Because that's when you allow yourself to paint the Democratic position or some Democrats position as, as, quote, extremist. as, exactly. as extremist. Yeah, yeah but when you cede that field altogether, yeah. you have to expect to lose. Well, I, initially I thought it was a clever and a smart way going about the feedback. Yeah. Put it where you can feel the pain, that's the beginning place, common sense. She spent one million dollars in terms of that particular. But, but in fact, but then that, even a member of his own party came out and mm -hmm. said, there's no medical evidence for that. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that undercut with at least some people that effort to compromise. Yeah. Well, let's move and, and, and jump in terms of Yunkin. Implications for Governor Yunkin. I know it's tied to his legacy, yes. mm -hmm. tying his hands in terms of legislature. But what do you think in terms of implications for Yunkin? Again, I'll start. With okay. You. Well, uh, first of all, had he been able to bring in the, uh, the legislature, the General Assembly, like he wanted to, and I thought this on election night, mm -hmm. then uh, he jumps up to the top of the vice presidential yes. Yes. Cons uh, candidates. Now, he might still be considered for that, but it's a lot less likely now than it was before. If I were advising Governor Yunkin, I would advise him to look at the last two years of the George Allen administration yes. and the Mark Warner yes. administration, both of whom had 
legislatures controlled by the other party, and both of whom had some very, very significant accomplishments and got a, some of their agenda passed and made into law, made into public policy in those last two years. I mean, Allen got parental notification in the last two years. He got a lot of uh, economic development done during the last two years. Warner got his budget agreement with the uh, tax increase in it. Uh, so it is possible things are a lot more partisan now than they were 30 years ago or even 10 years ago to be sure. But that's the model that I think Governor Youngkin needs to follow. Yes, yeah, Karen. I'm inclined to agree with that. With the proviso, of course, it has gotten much more partisan mm -hmm. and more polarizing. We also have a, a, a new legislature that doesn't have much experience being legislators. And so they're, they're, we're going to have a lot of turnover in both chambers of, of the legislature. They're not used to working with each other, much less with the governor. That's going to put some, some, some stops on some of this. I would say, though, in following that, let's find at least some common ground. I think there are many places that could happen. It could be, some it could be K-12 education, some version of school choice perhaps, but also transportation is a perennial issue mm -hmm. and economic development in various parts of the state. Well, um, and I agree with that. Um, I, I don't think the national, I think one of the things that he said, I still, the name recognition was to try to raise money. Yes. And we'll talk about mm -hmm. the money thing in just a moment. Um, and it was a way of keeping him alive. It's my understanding from uh, people close to him and what have you, he really has no interest in not, doesn't necessarily, in terms of related to Trump, nor his family be exposed to some of the attacks in terms of Trump. I think it's longer in the future. But let's get back to new districts, and I do want to, to say what I thought, or what makes this the most consequential. Mm -hmm. The impact in terms of Yonkin, that's one. Yes. But the other is about the generational change yes. coming to the composition yes. of the legislature. I mean, 40 new senators, 33%, I mean, 40% new senators, 33% in the House, lost almost 600 years of experience mm -hmm. walking out the door. Yes, more women more blacks uh, than before. The new leader of the House looks like it uh, will be uh, African-American and six blacks in the Senate. Hadn't had that many since 1869 from what I read. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly younger yes. by a generation, maybe a generation and a half, depending right. on how you do that. Mm -hmm. This is going to be incredible consequences. And yet what gets me here it was, 140 seats, all the new districts, most of them tended to favor 52, 54, one part or the other. By the primaries, 90%, mm -hmm. we already said. We did all of this for eight to 12 competitive legislative senators, six to eight. What do you think about the transition, the impact it had, and the future of our legislature is gonna be very, very different. Mm -hmm. Me first again? Yes. <laughs> we'll go with well, uh, one of the things I noticed going in on election night was that uh, I was looking at how many races were uncontested yes. after the primaries. The Democrats had 20 out of 100 in the House of Delegates in which they either had no opponent or a libertarian or, or some other uh, uh, non-major party opponent. Republicans had 15. It was three each in the Senate, in the, in the uh, Virginia State Senate. So there was another edge there. Uh, the Democrats had fewer seats that they actually had to worry about uh, because they had 20 of them, 20 of their candidates who were running unopposed. I think the generational change uh, is very difficult. The effect of that is very difficult for me to predict because on the one hand, since they don't have an experience, they also don't have a lot of sort of ingrained generational likes or dislikes or even hatreds uh, that uh, the returning guard might have had. And they're also uh, probably going to be more eager to build a legacy of, of their own, to get a legislative record. So on the one hand, they could, because they don't have the experience of compromise and negotiation, dig in their heels. On the other hand, their orientation might be more towards getting things done as opposed to scoring political points. I just, I just don't know how that's going to fall out yet, and uh, uh, I find the uh, new legislature in that regard very difficult to predict. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Karen, please. No, I, I, think, I think that's very likely to be true. The, the other argument one could make there, of course, is because of that lack of experience, um, you get a whole range of new, excited people wanting to make, make a mark mm -hmm. pretty quickly, and we know already they probably are going to be at different ends of the ideolo ideological spectrum. Right. That will make the tone somewhat different. That may op also open the door, if you will, for 
the state elected officials, all of whom are Republican, that can think about maybe setting, setting agendas and also sending the message and seeing what can be done with executive powers rather than just looking at the legislature. And so this may not only be an effort for some kind of bipartisan agreements, but also a time in which we're going to see maybe a much stronger effort to be a strong chief executive on Mr. Youngkin's part. Well, you know, also, just as a, as a footnote, isn't it interesting that there would be no Democratic senator west of the Blue Ridge? I did notice that. Uh, I can't say I'm surprised by that. Uh, we're increasingly becoming two very different Virginias. At, at, least, at least two, and what that really reflects, and this is true all over the country, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The kind of residential and other sorts of sorting that's been going on for generations. And we're really now picking that up in representative bodies like the state mm -hmm. legislature. I don't think that bodes well for the Commonwealth of Virginia as a whole. It certainly may not bode very well for parts of, the Virginia, parts of Virginia, like the one we're in, that aren't as well represented as they've, as they've been in the past. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, uh, people from this part of the state, they look at Northern Virginia and it's alien territory, they, uh, and vice versa. Yes. People in Northern Virginia look at our part of the state and they don't know what to make of, the, of rural Virginia. It, it's getting increasingly difficult for people in different parts of the state to even and see one another as fellow Virginians. And I agree with you, Karen, that definitely does not bode well for cooperation at the statewide level. I think so, and those other divisions, it's not just nor Northern Virginia and Southwest Virginia, it's also Hampton Roads, Eastern mm -hmm. Virginia, and the Richmond area, which is where the population growth has been. Right. So there, one could argue, we, we talk, talk about this in the classroom, <laughs> six or seven different Virginias, but I mm -hmm. think the divide between the more metro and the more rural are probably a very important one. Well, let's talk a little bit for a minute or so about the um, turnout. Um, I haven't seen a bottom number of that. I know we have 6.1 million in terms of registrations. But early voting, mm -hmm. that's a fact of life. It's here. I guess there was, as of uh, before the election, it was 800,000, 550,000 were uh, walk-in. Uh, the mm -hmm. 250 or so were um, in terms of by mail. Um, but what do you think about Yunkin's secure the vote? He spent $1.5 million on that. How do you think it impacted Republicans? I think if he hadn't done that, the results would have been much worse for Republicans. Uh, the, uh, the raw numbers on early voting from Republican and Democratic precincts show a fairly significant increase in Republican early voting. It's not, obviously it wasn't enough to turn the tide, but early voting is a tough sell with a lot of Republicans, so it's not something that's going to be done in one election cycle. But it was up maybe two or three percent over uh, uh, the previous uh, statewide election in, uh, in 2021, Republicans obviously hope that that trend continues and that they continue to not be totally dominated by the Democrats on the early voting. And, and I think that will probably happen. It might not happen in time for 2024, but uh, almost certainly in time for the next gubernatorial Building election. Building habits and things like mm -hmm. that. If I could add one thing. Yeah. It's Talking about early voting is important because that may be changing habits, and that certainly was one thing that Governor Youngkin wanted the legislature to revisit if it had gone Republican. That probably will not, will not happen now. But I'm, I worry about the years we compare. The best years for comparison to this election and turnout are probably other years in which there was no statewide candidate on the, on the ticket. And so if we compare overall state turnout, at least as of now, to when the years we look at are 2019, 2015, 2011. And sure. it turns out this year, it, it's, the, it's down to the 2015 level, it looks like, mm -hmm. not nearly as high as 2019. And so that's important to keep in mind yeah, in terms of talking is. about enormous turnout. In 2019, the turnout across Virginia was still low with no statewide candidate, but was 42.4%. Mm -hmm. Now it's projected to be about 30%. It's about what it was in 2015. It gets back to somewhat of that, yes. of that norm. And, um, and the difference between even congressional, you yes. get up to the 40, governors 55, mm -hmm. I mean, to the, to the almost 50. And of course, um, the governor 55 and presidential. President is, is when people turn about out. 70. Yeah, and so some people think, well, there's no reason to vote if a president or a congressional candidate isn't on the ballot. Right. That's a problem for both parties. Mm -hmm. And your vote counts more because it's weighted. In exactly. It's more exactly. critical. Exactly. Yes. Well, you know, now this is just me, and, I, and you would probably disagree with this, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying I'm going to get me some special email. Virginia now has um, the same day registration and they become these provisional ballots. And in some districts, they really push the college students, like in the 41st, mm -hmm. and in the Senate District 24 with yes. the William and Mary. I, okay, um, a freshman at Virginia Tech from Fairfax, been here three months, 
and is voting, even on the local issues and boards and stuff, I don't know, something about that just doesn't seem quite right. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna let me get by with it that easy. No, well, uh, well I'm, what I'm gonna say is something different, and that is I'd like to know more about who actually turned out and re became a new voter on this election day and voted, and voted, say, on a college campus. My sense in just interacting with students, that was a number of them, if they were gonna vote, they'd already done absentee, mm -hmm. or they were voting elsewhere in the Commonwealth if they're Virginia students, which many are not, of course. And a whole range of people, when we opened this up in class discussion, several people said, I don't know enough about the local issues. I care about what goes on at home. I right. care about the school board races where I'm from. I'm not necessarily going to get involved in Blacksburg. Now, the longer they're at an institution, maybe they will participate. But I understand the trepidation, no doubt about that. Well, and, and the fact of the matter is, it was written about in terms of young Democrats, yes. young Republicans, yes. busing, mm -hmm. standing in line, and especially the incident at William and Mary yes. was, was talked about. Well, so the money spent, my goodness. Last comparison when it was 2017, it was $124 million. And now we know for a fact it's already 180, yes. probably get close to $200 million, and we're almost back to where we were. All that outside money over half of it, um, or different sources and nonpartisan per se. Uh, that's just a staggering amount of money, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is a, a, a staggering amount of money, but it also is, is an amount of money that voters, if they're concerned about it, can check on it pretty yes. easily. Yes. I like the system we have here in Virginia for statewide elections, for state and local elections, where there are virtually no restrictions on how much you can give to a candidate, but it has to be reported. Anything, any contribution over $100 has to be reported. And now, of course, you can, with a couple of clicks, find out who, what sort of money is going to the candidate. The, can the opposition candidates, if they care to, can make outside money into an issue and on their ads can can uh, direct people to where they can learn more about this. So I have no particular problem with money being spent in campaigns so long as there's disclosure about it. And the concern for me is kind of the outside money and some of the PACs is not quite as easy to mm -hmm. see. Well, especially the, the 501c4s that, that give the dark money. So we know how much money is there, but we don't know who gave it. Right. And, and mm -hmm. that can be a concern for many people. Um, I'm inclined to agree with, with Professor Lynch that the disclosure system is the, is the best way for people to know what's going on. At the same time, the amounts of money are staggering, especially when, when we understand most of the scholarship says it doesn't make much difference. Right. So. And, and the other thing it does do is to the extent these ads take place is that, that for many voters is the first they learn about some issues and about candidate stands on those issues. So it really is a mixed bag about what one does about campaign finance, I think. Well, we're really down to three minutes, and I just want to take an opportunity for each of you to have a few moments. So from a 40,000 foot, what would you say lessons from this campaign? Ed, I'll start with you. Well, I think that uh, there is still a place in campaigning for retail campaigning. Uh, I think that uh, there, there were opportunities to reach voters that, uh, that both parties neglected. Uh, uh, I'm old fashioned that way, but I know that the very novelty of things like handing out leaflets at football games and things like that would probably attract a good deal of attention. I would reemphasize uh, the point that I made earlier on abortion, that uh, so long as Democrats successfully paint Republicans as extremists on that issue with no response from the Republican side. It's going to continue to be a very important issue for Democrats, uh, one that in some cases might even supersede economic concerns. I think that uh, uh, Governor Yunkin and uh, as Professor, uh, my, my professorial colleague said earlier, he has the opportunity to use all of the powers of the executive branch. Uh, there are months of the year where the legislature is not in session and the governor is governing more or less alone. I expect Governor Youngkin to take full advantage of that. I think we're gonna see that red fleece on television a lot. And we do have a moment, uh, a minute or so, please. 
I agree, not surprisingly, with virtually everything that, that <laughs> Professor Long said. I would add just a couple of things we haven't had a chance to talk about, and that is I do think this election underscored in Virginia what we're seeing around the rest of the country, not just in abortion rights, but the emphasis on K-12 education mm -hmm. and governing K-12 education. I think what Virginia may have shown in many parts of the state is that there is not so much interest in which bathroom p students use or the pronouns that are used, but there is real interest about doing something about the COVID gap in learning mm. and also trying to do something to get teachers and aides in the classroom where we've got real labor shortages all over the Commonwealth. Well, believe it or not, that is all the time we have. What a delight this has been. Thank Colleagues, you. I'm so appreciative of you coming and joining us. And I think it's gonna be an interesting legislative session coming up. Mm -hmm. And I wanna, obviously, I'm so enjoyed and thank my guests. And as always, I wanna thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.